So welcome everybody. I'm glad to be able to share with you two recent parish museum acquisitions. If we were walking through the museum, these canvases are displayed in the big double wide gallery, a wonderful venue for large pieces. Both works are gifts to the museum, expanding our collection, and are by living artists who work on the East End. Let's take a look at these works together. The first canvas we'll look at is by the artist Audrey Flack. <clears throat> she was born in New York City in Washington Heights in 1931 and attended New, York's, New York City's Music and Art High School. The title of this piece is Wheel of Fortune. Take a look at the work as I tell you a little bit about its creator and then we can dive into the stories that she weaves together. Flack says she was always an artist. And this is at a time when women artists are few and far between. She went from music and art to Cooper Union, where her work caught the attention of Joseph Albers, then Dean of the Yale School of Art. And he recruited her to New Haven with a scholarship and the lure of joining a center of art at the time. You would not recognize the work she did at Yale in this piece. It was the height of the Abex movement. And yes, she was a part. She spent time with Pollock and de Kooning, Motherwell, Krasner, and Farron. She says that she threw paint 30 feet across the room onto those canvases. But Flack is not to be pigeonholed into a style or a medium. She grew and changed and found a voice in a new approach, photorealism. Let's take a brief side trip to one of her photorealistic still lifes, Royal Flush. <clears throat> Photorealism, which developed in the 60s, incorporated photography into the process, resulting in canvases that appear to be super realistic or hyper realistic, more like photos than painted works, but they are tightly constructed. Black was among the first painters to apply the technique. And she reached into the pop art tool bag to include ordinary and real objects from cosmetics to cards to food. Here we see money, playing cards, cigarettes, cigars, <clears throat> alcohol. Can you construct a story? Who's playing? Men? Women? How big are the stakes? Is this about luck? Fortune? skill, risk, or desperation. In this piece, she embraces the stylistic effects beloved of photorealism, reflection, some metal, ordinary objects, but she puts her own mark here. We see no cars or diners or buses. So let's return to Wheel of Fortune and Flack's personal narrative. Flack is not only an outstanding, groundbreaking artist, she's also a woman, a wife, and a mother. In 1959, as a young married artist, Flack's first daughter, Melissa, was born. Shortly after, in 61, her second daughter, Hannah, was born. Melissa, it became evident, was a unique and handicapped child, autistic, in a time when autism was not at all well understood. Flack has said that it's hard being a female, a mother, and most especially the mother of a special needs person. Wheel of Fortune is one of three works in which, in a series uh, called Vanitas. This work, um, like the Alex Katz, is monumental. It's eight feet by eight feet. In this still life, Flack uses the structure of a classical vanitas piece, a style of Dutch painting that incorporated specific symbols referencing a particular narrative of faith and identity, but she appropriates this to her own narrative. In this piece, we have some classical symbols, fruit and time measures, but they are, but they are employed in a new way to tell a story of her life as an artist, a woman, a mother. Let's take a closer look. Do you see the girl in the upper left-hand corner 
This is a photorealistic painting of her handicapped daughter, Melissa. And next to it, we see ripe fruit, cherries. There, is, there are dice and a tarot card. Remember Royal Flush? Is this fate, chance, luck? It certainly says we're not in control. And then there are the symbols of time, an hourglass right in the center, a calendar on the lower left, a candle burning down, and a mirror. Yes, time is reflected in a mirror. The piece is luscious with lipstick and jewels and signs of youth. And then there is the skull reflected in the mirror to remind us that, well, remind us of death. One art critic, art critic has said, and I quote, she has taken the signs of indulgence, beauty, and excess and transformed them into a deeply moving symbols of desire, futility, and emancipation. One final note, the painting itself is a wheel. There are horizontal, diagonal, and vertical line, sight lines, and its high color value makes it both highly realistic and still very metaphorical. She achieves her effects by painting with acrylic, airbrush, and oil, whatever it takes. I wonder what you'll be thinking the next time you encounter a Wheel of Fortune. Now let's turn to another new acquisition. <clears throat> Here we're in front of a piece called The Flood by David Sally. Again, monumental. This work is eight by 15 feet. And again, let's take a, a look at the work for just a moment while I introduce you to David Sally. Sally was born in Norman, Oklahoma in 1952 and now lives and works in East Hampton. He grew up in Wichita, Kansas. Think Dorothy and Wizard of Oz and you are not in Kansas anymore. Like Flack, art was a passion for Sally, who took life drawing classes when he was only eight or nine. He studied at the California Institute of Art with John Baldessari, and his work combines images, often one on top of the other. Some of the images are original, and some are appropriated from pop culture, from art history, from film, from any source available to him. His art career is wide ranging, from painting to costume design for the American Ballet to cinema work with Martin Scorsese and, not least of all, art commentary. His work may seem random, but you'd be wrong there. All images are very de deliberate. Like Audrey Flack, Sally often uses photos as reference and many of his works are considered metaphors for our modern media culture. So, back to the flood. In 2004, Sally was commissioned um, by Carlo Bellotti, an Italian industrialist and art lover, uh, to create canvases for Bellotti's personal museum in Rome. Bellotti asked Sally to use the Sistine Chapel as reference, and from 2004, to 2006, Sally worked in East, in East Hampton on three monumental canvases entitled After Michelangelo. These canvases were first shown in Rome in 2006. Bellotti's widow, knowing Sally's connection to the East End, gifted to our museum the series. Let's take a brief look at the three works. These are monumental tributes to the Sistine Chapel and focus on three themes themes, creation, the flood, and judgment. Each work is comprised of two panels. The main panels address the theme and include specific Im images from the Sistine Chapel, juxtaposed with images from art history, news, and contemporary culture. Here's the creation. Take a quick look. It's not the creation of Adam and Eve, it's the creation of the sun and the moon. God is an action hero, and God's arms are spread to the sun on the right and the moon on the left. In Michael 
God was, God's rear was exposed. Eve was the linear nude, a more permanent nude than Adam. Sally started drawing and redrawing images, first on paper, then on canvas. How should he use Michelangelo's images? Think of the Warhol. Sally decided to paint the images in acrylic to simulate the luminosity of a fresco, but the flatness that would let image lay behind the others. Everything else is in oil, brighter, saturated, standing out. He never actually visited the Sistine Chapel. He worked from pictures in, from books and magazines, and then he embedded Michelangelo's so much, the symbols of art and life, newspapers, references, and virtual treasure hunt. So let's take a look again at the flood. Okay, um, one, one additional thing. You'll notice that each of these works is made up of at least two panels. On the left is the large panel with the thematic reference, and on the right is this very unusual panel of a vortex. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, a long depiction. Michelangelo is in the background. <clears throat> but take a look, left to right, foreground. Do you see two canvases? How about three? There's an elephant and camel. And what's this about? If you think it might be the Indian Ocean Tsunami in Bandi Ache, you'd be right. And gentle raindrops, both desired and problematic. Take a look at the wave on the bottom left foreground. Does it look familiar? It's a classical Japanese master woodcut image by Hokusai, an artist in the late 17th century Japan. And the wave is stylized, not catastrophic. But look again, there's a glass of water and then next to it, a rescue helicopter and a newspaper clipping. Do they remind you of Katrina or of Warhol? It's intentional. It's a bit of homage to a master Sally respected and who Belodi also revered. Do you see an embedded canvas of a lighthouse? It's in the center midground, and it's a clear reference to another painter, Marston Hartley. And the lighthouse, do you think it's a hopeful sign? And the dove, what symbol is that? Finally, let's look at the separate canvas on the right, the vortex. Perhaps this has some reference to Kansas and tornadoes. Perhaps this is an allusion to Japanese comics and anime such as Sailor Moon. It appears in all three pieces and it evolves. And there, smack in the middle, is that drop of water. Before we go, we'll just glance at judgment. There are loads of symbols here. Justice, death, time, a self-portrait, a book and pen, a gavel, a mushroom cloud, a bomb, frightful symbols of the end of judgment. And look, in the vortex, do you see the face of a cartoon character? This is the face of evil, Sailor Moon. It's a narrative, but one between Sally and you. And the answers are personal. Thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this time with us. Please come and see these wonderful works in our museum when we reopen.